The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ottawa, Hamilton, Waterloo, and Sault Ste. Marie. All four cities elected brand new mayors in last October's municipal elections. Tonight we hear from their worships, Sutcliffe, Horvath, McCabe, and Shoemaker about their first six months on the job. It's Tuesday, April 25th, and that's ahead on the agenda. Confession time here. Those of us who work in journalism often look askance at members of our so-called profession who decide to trade in their reporter's notebook for politics. I mean, don't journalists have the best jobs? And why would someone want to leave that for politics, a profession even more disrespected than journalism? Well, let's ask the new mayor of Canada's capital city, Mark Sutcliffe, who joins us from his office at Ottawa City Hall. Your Worship, it's great to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I love the way you frame that, Steve. And, and listen, it's great to be on your show, having watched you for so many years. Uh, so it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you for the opportunity. We should just tell people, even though you and I were sort of in the same game for a long time, we don't know each other. We've never met. This is the first time I think we're ever having a conversation. So why don't we start off where I just left off in that intro, which is, I well remember you. I used to watch you on CPAC, the cable public affairs channel, all the time. And I wonder, like, why is this guy giving up a really good gig for the vagaries of politics? <laughs> it's a great question. And, you know, I had a wonderful career as a broadcaster and columnist and journalist and also uh, a, a separate career on the side sometimes and sometimes full time as an entrepreneur. I started some newspapers and magazines and was involved in other businesses. And I had a great life, and this wasn't really in the plans. In fact, a year ago, if, if you and I had met at that time and, and, uh, and talked about my future, none of this would have been in the plans. But I've always cared very deeply about my community. I've lived my whole life in Ottawa, and I, uh, my, my parents were immigrants to Canada, and, and Ottawa was very good to them. And so I've always cared very much about the community. I've volunteered a lot. I've chaired boards of not-for-profit organizations. And so I care a lot about the city and about the future. And uh, and there was a, an election campaign that was underway. And there were a lot of people asking for someone else to step into the race who represented what they thought was in the best interest of the community. And uh, people approached me and I originally said no. And then I finally decided if if I could make a difference in my city and, and this was the way to do it, then I should give it a shot. We have an impression of politics from the outside that presumably you now from the inside can tell us what really goes on that we on the outside don't really appreciate. So I know it's only been half a year, but what have you learned about how things really work on the inside? Uh, one of the first things I would say, Steve, is, you know, I, I realize now how little I knew often when I was writing as a columnist about some issues there there. It's you know, it, it and I think it's important to know that the the public and, and members of the media understand the issues at a very high level. And that's natural. We're not expecting members of the public, frankly, nor the media to have as much knowledge as about uh, about an issue as the people who are working every single day on that file. Um, so I've learned a lot in, in the last six months about uh, the, the many, many different issues that uh, the city of Ottawa is grappling with going forward. Um, and I've, I've certainly learned what it's like to be on the other side of the microphone and and uh, what it's like to be interviewed. and. And uh, and yeah, so it's been it's been a real learning experience and it is it's very different in many ways from from journalism and from broadcasting. But I would say in one way it's the same in that in that it is all about how you are presenting to the community uh, the issues that are important. And so in some ways, I feel my job hasn't changed a lot because my job is 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 to talk about what's important to members of the community, to frame the issues in a way that they will understand and to help them uh, uh, together with city council make decisions about the future of our community. I want to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to put up a picture. And here comes the picture. This is you on swearing in day with the chain of office around your neck. How was that? It was very special. You know, as I've said many times, I think you can see there, I, I look a little bit emotional and, and very grateful. And 
Uh, I think about my mother's family who moved to Ottawa from China. They escaped the communist revolution in the 1950s and and moved to Canada to start over. And they came to Ottawa and it was uh, an opportunity for them. They they were able to find jobs and and my mother and her sisters went to university here and and had careers and started families. And, and so, you know, when I think about them arriving in Ottawa with almost nothing and starting their lives over, the fact that my grandparents one day could think that their grandson would be the mayor of this city is really special. And I think about my dad who moved here when he was 19 years old from the north of England. He'd never been outside the United Kingdom before and moved to Ottawa and and started his life here. Uh, My late father, you know, I know he'd be he'd be surprised and proud to see his son as the mayor of Ottawa and to be the mayor of my hometown, the city that I've lived my whole life in is just an extraordinary Extraordinary honor. Nice. How much does the current mayor want to know from the previous mayor? Well, Jim Watson was my immediate predecessor as mayor, and uh, and I've spoken to him several times uh, since the election. Uh, and when I, you know, it, when I have questions, uh, he's available to me, and he's and he's uh, supported me with information and and his thoughts on the issues. But I'm fortunate that I can rely on an amazing team here at the city of Ottawa. There's a lot of continuity with the senior staff at the city. And there are some people on my team who have worked at the city for a long time. So there are great people here. Uh, It's a large organization with a high level of expertise in uh, throughout the organization, but also in especially in the senior roles. So I'm relying on the terrific uh, people who work at the city of Ottawa, who devote their lives every day to making the city stronger and better and who really care about the future of our city. Now, Jim Watson was obviously the mayor when the convoy hit town, but now, of course, that is your responsibility. And if anything like that were to happen again, you'd be the guy, or at least one of the guys on the hot seat. And I guess we need to know whether or not you feel, based on what you know and what you've asked around about, is Ottawa better prepared now to handle some future disaster? Absolutely. I think a huge number of lessons have been learned uh, from the convoy itself, from the public inquiry. Uh, I think the the city and the police department and the RCMP and parliamentary protective services have been engaged in a in a many, many conversations, and there are much different plans in place. And I think we've already seen evidence of that, Steve. I think if you look at some of the other events that have happened in the past year uh, where people have attempted to repeat the convoy of February 2022. Uh, they have, have not been successful in, in taking over downtown Ottawa. They've been diverted away or or the roads have been blocked so that they're not able to, to get into the downtown core. Obviously, we are always ready in Ottawa as the nation's capital for peaceful, lawful protests and demonstrations, people walking through the streets of downtown Ottawa or, and onto Parliament Hill. But we don't ever want to see the events of February 2022 repeated in downtown Ottawa again. No, this was the great conundrum, is that because Ottawa is a unique city in the country, the police's responsibility, the city council's responsibility, the RCMP's responsibility, the protective services' responsibility, there just seemed to be a lot of overlap in that Venn diagram, and not everybody knew what everybody was responsible for. Are you clear in your mind right now that if you know what hit the fan tomorrow, everybody would know what to do? I believe that's true. I think there have been a lot of lessons learned, and I think one of the most important lessons was about communication. And and there are multiple jurisdictions at play here, obviously, and that's always going to be the case in a city like Ottawa. We have the the wonderful opportunity of being the nation's capital, and there's so many great things that, that go with that. We have wonderful museums. It's a great place to visit, and we have tourists coming from all over the world to see Ottawa. So being the nation's capital is a tremendous honor and opportunity for our city. But there are some responsibilities that go with that as well. And and having our local police force that is paid for through property taxes locally, having the additional responsibility of policing the nation's capital and dealing with events like those that occurred last year, that is an additional burden for the city of Ottawa. We're in regular conversations with the federal government about what that means and how we can support each other. And and but communication is critically important. So we have to make sure that that is paramount in uh, whenever any future events happen. I think you are unique in the province right now. You won't be after June 26th, but you are right now 
the only mayor out of 444 municipalities in the province with so-called strong mayor powers. Now, I know when you campaigned for office, you said you didn't intend to use them, but can you foresee any set of circumstances where you might want to and or need to use those powers? I don't foresee those circumstances. Uh, one of the things I said during the campaign is that I intend to work closely and collaboratively with the democratically elected city council. And we've started off uh, really well working together. There were some tensions and divisions in the final few years of the last term of council, but I think we've done a really good job of collaborating and cooperating. And there's some evidence of that already. Our first budget was passed last month unanimously, which is a rare event in Ottawa. Uh, so we're working together, we're collaborating, we're achieving consensus, and I don't think that I will, you know, I don't agree in principle with the idea of me overriding the will of council, the will of a democratically elected council, and I don't intend to use those powers. I think we're going to be able to work very well together to get things done. One of the things I suspect you've already learned on the job is that you really need the province on side for so much of what you may want to do, despite the fact that I think the city of Ottawa has a population comparable to probably six out of 10 provinces in the country. Should it be that way? I don't know if uh, it should be that way, Steve, but it is that way. Uh, so we, we have to work with what we've got. Uh, it is interesting, you know, I've, I've learned, uh, I always knew this obviously, but I've learned just, just how much impact uh, how much impact there is from the fact that mun municipalities are creatures of the province and have very limited means to generate additional revenue and, and so many things that we're mandated to deliver. So a big part of the job is working with other levels of government, the federal government and the provincial government. And a big part of the job is asking for their help and support, and in particular financial support, to deliver what we need to, uh, to the community. So uh, I'm fortunate that I have a very good relationship with Premier Doug Ford and his his cabinet and his government. And I also have a very good relationship with the Prime Minister, with Justin Trudeau's cabinet and with his government and with the local MPs. So uh, I intend to work very closely with them to make sure that Ottawa always gets its fair share of funding and that we are collaborating on the key issues and that, and that the city is able to deliver to its residents what it needs to in areas like homelessness and housing and transit and safety and security and so much more. Let's finish up on this. Can you complete this sentence, please? My time as mayor of Ottawa, however long it lasts, will have been worth it if I can what? If I can make life better for all Ottawa residents, if I can make Ottawa safer, more reliable and more affordable. Uh, we're going through an affordability crisis right now in our community like so many others. We've had some issues of reliability of city services, including transit. We want to fix those and we want to make sure Ottawa is a safer and more prosperous community. So we're focused on economic development and on revitalizing downtown Ottawa and the Byward Market, the historic Byward Market that's about to turn 200 years old in a few years. So I, I want to make life better for everyone in Ottawa, not just a select few, but make sure that we are growing our city in a sustainable way, in a way that benefits all Ottawa residents. I'm curious as to what your reaction was the first time somebody said, hey, your worship, and they meant you. <laughs> I'm still getting used to that. It's not a title that I, I like a whole lot. I don't even really have an affinity for that chain of office that you showed me wearing in a picture. Uh, I think that's the only time I've actually worn it, uh, maybe one other time as well. But uh, I'm not a fancy titles kind of person, so um, I'm adjusting to the fact that uh, people... Uh, have a tendency to not call me Mark anymore. That's been probably one of the biggest adjustments that well, I've had, and, Steve. And I'm not going to do it either because you're the mayor now. So <laughs> I'm going to say, Your Worship, Mayor Sutcliffe, it's been great having you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. It's been my pleasure, Steve. Thank you so much. For almost two decades, Andrea Horvath worked at Queen's Park, mostly criticizing governments for not doing what she thought they ought to be doing. But now, Horvath is the mayor of Hamilton, and for the first time in a very long time, is now responsible for implementing an agenda. Let's find out how that's going. In the home of the Tiger Cats, here's Mayor Andrea Horvath coming to us from her office at Hamilton City Hall and your worship. It's good to see you again. How are you? 
It is my pleasure, and I'm doing great. And Oski Wee Wee. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, when you were at Queen's Park in opposition, they called you the Steel Town Scrapper. Uh, sometimes government members called you worse than that. But in any event, how did you react the first time somebody looked at you and said, hello, Your Worship? It was, uh, it was something. It still is something to, uh, to have that... that uh, uh, that moniker, first of all, it's very, very formal, but um, yeah, it, it gives me a, a moment to, to pause almost every time I hear it. I, I, am I thrilled? Absolutely. Um, is it still the case, though, coming back after 18 years at the legislature, they should have listened to me. It would have made my job as mayor a lot easier had those had those governments listened to me when I was criticizing them or offering them solutions. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, getting back to my intro, um, I guess the mind, well, you tell me, is the mindset different now because your job is no longer to go to work every day and oppose the government's agenda of the day, but rather to implement an agenda of your own that you campaigned on and now are responsible for implementing? Yeah, it, it, it's actually exciting. It's um, it, it is something to have to um, really be the the criticizer of everything uh, and never the implementer uh, in opposition. And uh, as third party, that was tough. Uh, as official opposition, uh, it uh, it was um, it was really important work all the way along. But uh, being in a position now to uh, to not only you know not only implement you know my agenda. But to work with the city council, we have a lot of very progressive city councillors uh, that were elected to uh, our council. Uh, lots of r really committed people around climate, uh, around housing, uh, around uh, around how with the health and well-being of our community overall. You know, downtown transportation, mass transit, all of these things. It's 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 quite exciting, and uh, and seeing you know really, Steve, when I left. City Hall back in 2004. Uh, I had served for seven years uh, in the downtown, never having seen a crane, not only in those seven years, but probably for the 20 or 30 years prior to that. And now I can look out my office in any direction and I can see cranes in the sky. So Hamilton is, um, is changing rapidly and uh, it's exciting, but the, it also brings challenges. We want to build strong communities, not just you know, not just buildings. Uh, some some uh, uh, some folks call them boxes in the sky. We don't need that. Uh, we need uh, we need communities. But it is exciting to see Hamilton transforming um, and being able to be a part of it. Well, if people were looking for evidence of the change in your relationship with the Premier of Ontario, uh, they didn't have to go too far. It was a few months ago that he came to Hamilton. You two did an announcement together, and uh, well, why don't we let the tape tell the tale, uh, Sheldon? If you would, let's roll this clip. I also want to welcome Mayor Horvath, who I'm thrilled to be standing with instead of standing across the aisle from her. <laughs> now, you've got to explain to us how, after basically four years of trying to carve that guy a new one every day, suddenly you two are all smiles there. How does that happen? Uh, well, you know what? It's um, it, it is it's it's as I said during the campaign, actually, and it's it's the truth. I mean, we uh, we all have a job to do, and in the legislature, uh, I had a job to do, and and, and at first, I, I think it um, it um, perhaps it. it uh, it, it, it caught the premier uh, when he was newly elected unawares at, at at how hardball I had to had to be because that was my job. But he began, I think, eventually to understand that it was my job. Uh, and then, of course, then when I became the mayor, uh, we our first conversation it was actually at that at that um, announcement. Um, we we had a we had a good laugh about it. Really, he said, you know, I came in all hot and uh, you had been there a long time so you knew what you were doing uh, and then he said um, you know he said he's learned a lot he said he's learned a lot over the last couple of years uh, and then with his new mandate looking forward to working with myself as well as mayors around uh, the province to um, you know to 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 bring change to communities particularly of course as you know uh, the housing agenda is a, is a big one for them but but it's not just been it's not just been uh, the premier i've uh, i've had really great conversations and discussions with with most of the cabinet ministers uh, including neil lumsden who i served with on a committee uh, back in the day uh, when i was on city council with a cycling championship so we go a, a long way back uh, but um, but it really is about 
putting aside from my perspective now, putting aside the partisanship uh, and finding ways to partner. And uh, and that's what I'm committed to doing. And so whether it's with uh, whether it's with, uh, uh, you know, Minister Clark, who I met yesterday, who I spoke to and who I text with from time to time uh, about housing, uh, whether it's uh, with uh, with the premier uh, about investments, uh, uh, um, Minister Fideli uh, around economic development. Um, it's it's been very, very positive. And, and we just we don't we talk about the things that we can do together. Um, and I don't you know, I don't rip them one anymore. That's somebody else's <laughs> job now. Well, uh, OK, I want to see if I can pull the, the, the peel the curtain back a little bit more and see how that works, because it would be understandable after four years of taking barbs from you across the floor and frankly, giving back against you as well. It would be perfectly normal for you to win your election as mayor and for them to say, we're going to do everything in our power to screw her over because she made our life so difficult for the last four years. I really need a better understanding of why you think that's not happening. Well, you know, I, th I think that's a question that needs to be asked uh, of, the, of the premier, frankly. But um, but I think that um, I think that he, he's. I mean, it's all about politics, I guess. And uh, and look, he's got a couple of. MPPs here in the Hamilton area uh, with with Minister Lumsden uh, and with uh, with uh, MPP Donna Skelly. Skelly. Yep. Yeah, MPP Skelly. And so um, I, I think that he realizes that some of his own members are representatives of this city. And if we can find the ways uh, to work together to move things forward for all of Hamilton, uh, that benefits Hamiltonians and and his, um, he's got members of his caucus that are representing Hamiltonians. And so we, we do have some common ground there. Okay. I do want to ask you about how strong a mayor you intend to be. And by that, I mean the mayor of Toronto, the next one, whoever it is, when elected in June, will have so-called strong mayor powers. The mayor of Ottawa in legislation has strong mayor powers. Says he isn't going to use them, but he has them. Do you want them? Well, I mean, I think this is this is something that uh, is is really important to watch now over the next little while. Uh, I've I said during the campaign, and I believe that the best way to get to dis, uh, decisions in um, in an appropriate way is to bring people together, and that's kind of my history. I was a community development worker, uh, community development coordinator for a, a legal clinic before I even got elected. It was all about bringing people together, finding common ground, finding a, a way forward. And and when I think about our city council, uh, that that's what we're trying to do. Uh, are there disagreements? Absolutely. Are there times when we have a like when we have a hard and fast vote where it's almost split down the middle? Absolutely. But far, far more uh, often we have votes that are you know that are completely unanimous. Uh, and and that's that's the I think that's the pro appropriate way to govern to find the way forward uh, where where we we can get people behind something that uh, will improve our city or that uh, that responds to a concern. Uh, that the, the residents of our city have. And that's the way I've always operated. Uh, and I'm, I mean, certainly as an opposition leader, I, I get it. That's not exactly the same kind of a role, but uh, but that's that's exactly what I hope to continue to do. It's worked so far. I can't see why it wouldn't work going forward. Uh, and there are some tough issues that, we're, we, that we need to address, but no, I'm, I get you. I'm confident. I, I get you, but I wanna, uh, I wanna press you a little bit on this because if Doug okay. Ford comes to you and says, Look, I'm taking a second look at this for a lot of big cities around the province. The mayor of Mississauga wants it. The mayor of, you know, wherever wants it. If if I offer it to you, Andrea, do you want it? What would you say to the premier under those circumstances? Well, I, I would I would basically say I don't need it. Uh, I, I don't think that I need it uh, at this point. But um, again, I, I don't think that we've seen enough yet as to uh, how these other cities uh, are going to manage. Uh, I know that there's a, I mean, the, the, the mayor of Ottawa is frankly brand new, uh, has never served before as a mayor. And uh, we'll see what happens with the by-election by -election in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, but at this point, I, I don't. I don't know that I need that. Uh, that uh, those powers. Is there is there some uh, benefit to them? I think the proof will be in the pudding, and that's why it was smart. I think for the premier to um, to test drive it in a couple of uh, municipalities. Gotcha. Okay, there is an LRT that will allegedly be built in our city. I say our because I'm from there, as you know. In um, to the tune of more than a billion dollars. And I'm not sure anybody I've talked to yet knows when it's actually going to be done. Do you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. The Metrolinx is actually setting up a, an office this summer in the downtown at the Connaught. Uh, we are in the process right now. We've just passed our budget and embedded within that budget are some public works that are happening underground, uh, moving some water mains and those kinds of things to make sure we still have the volumes that we need, uh, but um, but moving them away from uh, where, you know, the route, if you will, where, where the LRT is going to be. Those works uh, are the all Although they're in our budget, uh, they will be covered off by the Metrolinx uh, uh, dollars, including all of the the actual hard infrastructure, but the staff time as well. So really, it's already starting. Uh, and shovels in the ground, you know, it, it, hopefully before the end of next year, uh, but certainly by the by 2025, there will be shovels in the ground and, and will be under construction. Right now, Metrolink's in the process of building, uh, rather buying up some more properties. Um, and yeah, it's full steam ahead. Okay, let me ask you about something that uh, I know you've been asked about this a lot in the past, but we haven't had a chance to talk about it on this program. And I must confess that, um, you know, with, with many cities around this province having elected their first female mayors decades ago in some cases, it's kind of shocking to me that you are the first female mayor in Hamilton history. And I wonder whether that achievement matters to you. Um, I think, you know what, I think it does. I, I feel proud of, I feel proud of it. Uh, you know, all through my political life. Uh, I've had mums and uh, you know, particularly mums and grandmas and aunts tell me about how, you know, how their daughters ha have watched my political career and how they, they talk about me to their daughters or to their nieces or to their granddaughters. Uh, and, uh, and it, it gives it gives them a great a sense of hope uh, when they see that their their you know female children uh, or grandchildren etc are um, you know are able to see a role model in a in a position that you know in in past centuries and decades hasn't been the case and that makes me that thing makes me feel good actually and I feel positive about that and so when people say you're the first female mayor of Hamilton how does that make you feel I feel darn proud but it also comes with a great deal of responsibility and thoughtfulness not only around the role that I play in in terms of you know building this city in a sustainable uh you know a whole of community kind of way uh, but that the work that I do is also being um, uh, being uh, being a, a role model for for young younger women and, and girls and and being a you know and being a voice being a woman's voice um, that 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 other women and uh, and girls can um, can look to as a you know a, as a beacon towards what they can achieve. All right. In our last thirty seconds, I want to come full circle here and take you back to the very first thing you said to me when we started this conversation, and those words were Oski Wee Wee. The Hamilton Tiger Cats have not won the Grey Cup since 1999, and I want to know what the mayor of Hamilton plans to do about that. Well, I'll be there cheering in the stands as always and pushing really hard. Uh, look, we have such a great, um, uh, not only team, but such a great team spirit, uh, such a great fan base uh, here in Hamilton. And even, you know, expats like yourself still come to the games and cheer on uh, the Cats. And so I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to the season. And yeah, um, but and I'll be Mayor there Horvath, and if cheering alone got it, would have got it done, we would have done it years ago. I don't know what the heck it's going to take. So I'm, I'm, I'm tasking you with this responsibility. Okay. Okay. Well, um, uh, being a longtime politician, I can't make that promise because I don't <laughs> know that I can actually be the one that'll have it go over the finish line, but uh, I'm with you on it. All right. Oski Wee Wee indeed. That's Andrea Horvath, the mayor of Hamilton. We're grateful for your time on TVO tonight. Many thanks. My pleasure as always, Steve. Take care. Election night for most mayoral candidates is exciting, but not necessarily a nail-biting experience. John Tory won in Toronto by almost 250,000 votes. Bonnie Crombie won in Mississauga by almost 80,000 votes. But in Waterloo, the winning candidate squeaked in with a 331-vote margin. Safe to assume election night in Canada's technology triangle was a little more tense. Here's the new mayor of Waterloo, Dorothy McCabe, with more on her first half year in office. Your Worship, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Great to be back again. Well, let's just start where we left off there, okay? 331 votes. That's not exactly a landslide. So what was election night like for you last October? 
Well, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously exciting, but a nail biter. Um, one of the one of the interesting, very Waterloo things is I had one of one of my volunteers was a data scientist who was uh, very keen uh, in keenly interested in politics as well. So when we started to see the numbers come in, because wards that I won came in first, and I won the uptown area really substantially. So looking at the numbers, and then as my so my the initial result was that like the first round in Kate was showed me and with quite a significant lead. And then as other polls came in, it was starting to drop. So I, I contacted this volunteer and asked him, I'm like, so can you run the numbers quickly? You're, you're a data <laughs> scientist. Can you, can you tell me, like, do you think like, am I, am I going to hold this or not? And he about five minutes called back and said, yeah, yeah, no problem with this percentage turnout and this and all these criteria. He's like, yeah, there's no, she would have had to win the last reporting poll by 25%. So by about, so I felt really comfortable by about nine o'clock that, but it was called about 9.30. So, um, but yeah, it was obviously really exciting. Um, I was really glad my mom was there and I've got a big family. So most of my sisters uh, were there as well. And my brother, who's a counselor, wasn't able to make it, but it was, uh, it was a great celebration. Did your opponent call to concede? Yes. And how did that call go? It was very brief. It was very brief. Yes, there was, um, I would say, uh, there was not the expectation that I was going to win. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so mine was a bit of a come from behind because um, I was I was working up until about August uh, 12th or so. So I entered the race right before, like four or five days before the, um, before the nomination period closed. So I had a lot of ground to make up. Um, she had entered it May 2nd, the first day you could you could enter um, your nomination. But like I, I had I had to keep working um, up until August. So yeah, I had a lot of ground to make up. I had a really energized uh, volunteer team, and we just you know we we use the data we have. We have, I think, pretty strategically to really target where the, um, as low as the voter turnout is, we really targeted where we thought we could, you know, fish where the fish are and where we could pull votes. So we had a really energized team, hit the ground every day, um, ran a really smart st social media campaign, and then had a really good get out the vote on the day of the election. So I think all those things combined, you know, it's, it's a million little things that have to go right well, not a million, but a lot of things that have to go right to pull off a victory. Well, uh, and and you know what losing is like, because uh, lest I need to remind you, uh, four and a half <laughs> years ago, you ran for the provincial Liberals in that 2018 Ontario election, and you came third. That was a very rough night. What do you think you yeah. learned, though, running and losing? Because I often hear candidates say they learn a lot more losing than they do winning, although winning is better. But what did you learn losing that helped you run for mayor four years later? That's a really great question. And so one of the things, like in 2018, I like I was pretty sure I was going to lose. So it was it was it wasn't a crushing defeat for me personally because I went in pretty sh knowing pretty sure that Catherine Fife, our MPP, who is quite popular here, was going to was going to prevail. What I I ran though at that point thinking that the um, all the signs were showing that there would be a minority government one way or another, and that, so I thought. You know, I'll run, I'll lose, I'll learn about campaigning and, and my team and what I need to do personally, et cetera. Um, and then I thought there might be a by-election, or sorry, a, um, a, it'd be a minority government and there'd be another election in, two years later. So I always like to say I got half of it right. I knew I was going to lose, but I didn't get the part about the... <laughs> no, the Tories the won their majority. The minority they did yeah so um but it really was like almost like a run through for this campaign right i, I really learned a lot more about the community um and get, re, uh, found a bunch of new volunteers for myself um and just really understood sort of for my own resilience what i what it actually takes to and with my family what it actually takes to go through um, an election because it's it's grueling. It's you know it's basically 24 hours a day. You really have to have the support of some like my partner was fantastic and our and you know he really just took care of the kids and all those things at home right and just gave me the support I need. So that really just mentally then helped me understand what I would need to do to be successful in the in my mayor's campaign. 
Let's talk about your priorities, and I'm going to raise off the top here a little conversation I had a few weeks ago with Peter Bethlen Falvey, Ontario's Minister of Finance, and he said that when he met with Waterloo officials, they identified three main priorities. Number one was all-day two-way GO Transit service. Number two was all-day two-way GO Transit service. And number three was all-day two-way GO Transit service. So guess what I'm going to ask you about first? Uh, GO Transit service. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> How close is your city to actually having this? Well, I mean, that's probably a better question for someone from Metrolinx or from the Provincial Tra Ministry of Transportation. Um, so I was, I used to, I worked at the city of Kitchener and started that, um, the advocacy work and put together the business case uh, back in 2011, 2012. And worked with our, you know, got our community um, partners involved and, and, and our neighboring municipalities. So I led that whole project uh, to go to Queen's Park at the time and talk to uh, former Premier Kathleen Wynne, was the Minister of Transportation at the time, to, to talk to her about the project. So at the time, and then she was the Premier when she did announce it. So at the time, they, we, they told us it's, it's a 10-year project. There's a massive amount, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate, there's a massive amount of infrastructure. Um, like bridges need to be widened, new track needs to be laid, level crossings, you know, all that kind of work that, that needs to be done. So uh, my fingers are crossed. That was in 2014 when they said it was going to be a 10-year project. So my fingers are crossed that 2024, um, there, it will be a full, fully functioning two-way all day go because it's really important for us um, of course, to get into Toronto seamlessly, but it's as important for people to come from Toronto uh, to our region, um, not only just for our tech sectors, but Waterloo's a small town, like 140,000 people, but we've got three post-secondary um, institutions. There's people, students, faculty moving back and forth across that innovation corridor all the time. So um, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed. There have been some other improvements to the service, um, even over the past couple of years. So we're grateful for that. Um, but I think ultimately, uh, transportation and moving people is just, uh, you know, with climate change, but with our economic development needs, uh, it's just, it's really a high priority. I think for, it should be, if it's not for most communities, like Waterloo people want to get to Hamilton or Stratford or London or, you know, lots of places where if we had better uh, op options rather than just cars, um, I think that would be great for lots of people. The greater Toronto area gets a disproportionate share of attention when you talk about housing, uh, but I want to know what the housing, I mean, we call it a crisis here. I don't know. Is it a crisis in Waterloo? What does it look like there? Oh, yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, again, as I just said, we're 140,000 uh, residents, but we have three post-secondary institutions, which are, you know, we, we're extremely grateful and fortunate to have. They add a great deal to our community, but they also bring approximately 65,000 students to our community. So that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on our housing stock, particularly since universities uh, and the college haven't built a new residence in years. Uh, the University of Waterloo is in the process of, uh, finalizing design for a new one but it's been years in between so we are we are but but we for 10 plus years with our strategic plan we've been grow, very much growing up water or growing growing in height i mean growing in height um we've reached our land boundaries uh, a few years ago so our entire with the with our light rapid transit system um and we we've been focusing on intensification so we know the you know the province obviously has their new targets we will easily meet those targets within 10 years we've got about 20 maybe 22,000 housing units at some point in our development pipeline um and uh yeah i think we're we're no different than most cities i mean we're a city that's growing we're a city that's very vibrant we're a city with a, a ton of potential so we're a city that tra attracts a lot of new residents but also students, and we want to keep them in our community when they are uh, when they do graduate. I may be wrong about this, but I checked the list of MPPs at Queen's Park, and I don't think you've got a cabinet minister from the Kitchener Waterloo Cambridge area in this current government. And and no. and your part of Ontario almost always does have at least somebody, at least one person in the cabinet. Do you think it will be more difficult to get stuff done given that reality? 
Well, I mean, we we haven't in Waterloo, we haven't had a cabinet minister in Waterloo since uh, Elizabeth Whitmer. So that goes back a few years. But we've still been able to, you know, partly through the strength of the of the mayor uh, in the in the office, but also working with our associations and working with our other municipalities, we and working with the, you know, the government members we do have, um, you know, I still think we're able to to get what we need and certainly communicate what Waterloo needs and Waterloo Region needs. We like regional councillor or sorry, regional chair Karen Redman, she's a very seasoned politician and she's she's very involved with, you know, AMO, she's on the MOU table, she's the chair of Marco. So I mean particularly through her, like I stay in close contact with her as a regional councillor as well. And so she understands Waterloo's needs and you know and, and I connect with the MPP Michael Harris or Mike Harris um you know when i can and uh you know just last week was that last week or the week before i guess the premier ford was here and i had a chance to sit down with him so i think i think we're a big enough community and an important enough community and a community as i said that's really on the move that that uh, they know they have to pay us at least some attention gotcha i want to in our last minute and change here show you a picture that goes back okay. almost 65 years this is in Waterloo when Queen Elizabeth, who obviously was a very young woman at the time, came and made an official visit. And that person to her right is the mayor of Waterloo with the chain around his neck, the chain of office. And I'm not going to play 20 questions with you here, but I just thought you might <laughs> like to know that that guy's name was Harold Pakin. My cousin was the oh. mayor of Waterloo 65 years ago. And I guess my last question really? is, there's supposed to be, I, I mean, I haven't been there in years, so I don't know if it's still there, but there's supposed to be a wall at City Hall with the pictures of all of the former mayors on it. And I want to know for sure whether Harold Pakin's picture is still on the wall at City Hall. That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, if you've got a few more minutes, I'll go, in, I'll go walk down the hall and take a look. I'm sure it's still there. That's wonderful. I didn't realize we had that connection. That's fantastic. I think he. I think I'll he was the mayor. I'll go and Stephen. I'll let you know. Please do. I think he. He was the mayor. I think in the late fifties, early sixties, for for I think just one term, but uh, his picture's up in my office, and now a few more people will know about it too. So there, I've done. Oh, I've done the wonderful. job for my family. There we go. Well, anytime you want to come back to Waterloo or move to Waterloo, I know you love <laughs> you, you love Hamilton, but we've got room for you in Waterloo, Steve. That is good to know. Uh, Your Worship, it's great for you to spend so much time with us tonight here on TVO. Thanks very much, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again down the road. I look forward to that. Thank you, Steve. So, we've heard from the mayors of some pretty big cities. Ottawa, population almost a million. Hamilton, population 540,000. Time to hear from one of our smaller cities. Matthew Shoemaker is the new mayor of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, population 72,000. And he joins us now from the mayor's office at City Hall in the Sioux. Your Worship, it's good to have you on TVO again. How are you doing? I'm doing great, th Steve. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Why did you want to run for mayor in the first place? Well, I'd been on council for a couple of terms and uh, got my my feet wet uh, trying to change uh, some of the things here around City Hall. And there was a vacancy in the in the mayor's chair coming up because our uh, incumbent mayor wasn't uh, seeking re-election. So I thought I still had more to give to the community and uh, and wanted to try my hand at uh, you know leading the council and seeing uh, if there was uh, a direction that we could. Uh, uh, steer our community in. Well, let me put this next question delicately, which is, you're 34 years old. Did anybody ever say to you during the course of the campaign, you're too young to be the mayor? They've been saying that to me since I got on council when I was 24 <laughs> years old. So uh, I've never put too much stock in that. I think, uh, you know, I, I came to council, uh, uh, you know, on a promise to bring new energy and fresh ideas to council. I did that over the course of uh, eight years, I would say, anyways. Um, and uh, I, I, I proposed the platform that I ran on, regardless of my age, and I was uh, grateful that it carried the day. Because of the age that you are at, and I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring this picture up, you had the uh, great pleasure of having both of your parents at your swearing-in ceremony, which is, of course, something not a lot of older mayors can necessarily experience. So how was that experience for you? 
Well, it was great. I mean, my parents uh, are the whole reason I'm I'm where I am today. You know, they raised me. Uh, uh, I I think they did a great job raising uh, all three of us, myself and my siblings, and uh, I'm I'm extremely proud of them uh, for how the values that they instilled in us and uh, the work ethic that they instilled in all of us. So I was I, it was emotional having them there. I was extremely happy to have them there. My mom, uh, as I've mentioned in the past came to Sault Ste. Marie from Italy in uh, 1969 at a young age. So uh, she uh, was born without anything and, and has come to the Canada and made a life for herself, come to the Sioux, made a life for herself. Uh, my dad worked at the steel plant his entire career and uh, together they were able to build good, solid middle-class lives and, and give us, their three kids, a better opportunity than what they had. <laughs> what was it like to gavel in your first council meeting as the mayor in the mayor's chair? It was, it was good, a, a bit nerve wracking. I mean, that was the inaugural meeting that you just showed a picture of. So it was ceremonial more than uh, business-like, but uh, the next meeting a, a couple weeks later was uh, a little bit nerve wracking. And, uh, you know, you, I, I had sat through a lot of council meetings, but when you're sitting through a council meeting as a counselor, you're focused on, okay, you know, when's my turn to speak and what am I going to say? Whereas when you're sitting in the mayor's chair, you have to keep track of everybody's speaking order. You have to keep track of uh, where you are on the agenda in terms of uh, issues that have been discussed, issues that are, are going to be pulled for debate. And uh, uh, it's really a lot more uh, organization of the meeting than it is uh, speaking on any mm. specific issue. Now, admittedly, you haven't had the job for even a year yet. So, um, but having said that, you are still probably in a position to now know what's possible that a mayor can do and what's really beyond the powers of a mayor to do uh, for a variety of reasons. What have you learned about that so far? Yeah, I, I think I had a pretty good sense of that from my time on council. I, uh, I, I, I you know, you, you delve into areas like... Um, uh, snow plowing is a big one in Sault Ste. Marie. You delve into those when constituents bring you complaints uh, over the course of the years and you determine, okay, well, this is really governance and this is really administration. So I had, I had had a good sense of that, but I think that there's an ongoing uh, learning about that issue. And, and uh, I would say that um, it's always, you're, you're always going to get a bit of pull and play on on that issue in terms of uh the capital spends and uh and and things that you know constituents might bring to you that you'd like to see happen but that are really um that are really within the administration's um uh, uh wheelhouse to to deal with things like sidewalk uh maintenance uh, uh schedules and 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 you know how how our public works does this or does that and our parks uh, or how our transit department runs the buses uh, those are all things that really the administration has to tackle, but they're the things that we get as concerns from constituents. So it's, you know, you have to you have to find that balance between those two things to be able to provide the customer service that constituents expect, while at the same time letting the administration run run the city. Sure. Well, let me raise a tougher issue, which is, uh, and we've covered this uh, many times on this program, there are mental health and addiction issues in almost every urban municipality and rural municipality, for that matter, uh, in this province today. How about in the Sioux? How tough an issue is it for you right now? Yeah, it's the top issue in the Sioux. It was the top issue for all the campaigns uh, for mayor, all the campaigns for council. It is the most pressing um, uh, and most difficult challenge that we have in our community. And the problem really is that we do not have the services in place that other communities do. So in our neighboring communities of Sudbury and Timmins, they've got uh, consumption and supply, consumption and treatment services for, um, uh, for folks who, who are drug users. But in Sault Ste. Marie, we don't have that. And in fact, Timmins, which had the highest rate of opioid overdoses and deaths in the province implemented uh, consumption treatment services and brought that down. I, it's still high. They're third or fourth in the province, but we are um, second in the north uh, in terms of in terms of death rate and opioid um, uh, overdose rate. So it's really a, it's a health care problem, but it's one that requires municipal involvement. Unfortunately, um, the province funds consumption treatment services, 
but the city has to put in the capital. So we have to have a building set up as a clinic, as a treatment space for the province to be able to fund it. And even when we do, what they found in Sudbury and Timmins is that provincial funding is uh, slow to slow to have the tap turned on. And uh, so it's been a problem in, in Sudbury and in Timmins. They've been paying for this uh, type of service themselves out of their municipal dollars. We don't have the capacity to do that. Um, and so we're putting in all the applications to the province to get those types of services here in the Sioux. But, uh, you know, it's going to depend on provincial help to actually help, you know, to actually uh, improve the situation. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but you do have a provincial cabinet minister at the cabinet table who's the MPP for Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which is an unusual thing. The Conservatives don't normally represent that city at Queen's Park. So, I mean, I presume you are bugging the hell out of Ross Romano to get something done on this. What's happening? Yeah, and Ross and I, we, we speak uh, twice a week, most weeks. So I, I'm in close uh, communication with him. Um, he's on side in terms of uh, uh, the, the need for this type of uh, treatment service in the community. He's also on side with a number of other you know, host of services that that play into uh, that space because there's no, as I've told uh, many people, there's no one treatment or or service that's going to uh, completely fix the problem. It's going to be uh, a, an entire menu of services that will help improve the situation. So he is on board with consumption and treatment services. He's on board with the return of what we called uh, the day treatment program here locally. Um, but, you know, the, the wheels of provincial bureaucracy uh, uh, turn slower than I think I would like. And certainly I think slower, uh, I, can, I can represent slower than he would like. So it's just a matter of getting these things uh, in front of the minister's eyes, under the minister's nose continually so that um, the scope and the severity of the problem is, is well understood. And that's what I've been trying to do anytime there's a minister that comes through town, anytime I have uh, our MPP on the phone, it's to reiterate the points so that it's uh, ingrained in their minds how severe and how uh, critical this of, a, of an issue this is in town. You know, the Premier, Doug Ford, often boasts about the fact that everybody's got his phone number and any politician in the province can call him up whenever they want and he'll be responsive to them. And I have heard from numerous politicians that they do that and he is. Have you tried that yet? I have. In fact, I spoke with the Premier uh, a month to six weeks ago and uh, explained that this is the most critical uh, and pressing need that we've got in our community. He understood it. I also spoke to him at the same time of the need and, and the desire of people in our community to see all of the Ontario Lottery Corp jobs consolidated into a single office in Sault Ste. Marie. We are the headquarters, at least that's what they call us but we don't have any of the executives, uh, any of the uh, executive level uh, employees here in Sault Ste. Marie. So I raised those issues as well as a couple others with the premier when we spoke on the phone. And, uh, you know, he was cordial. He, he obviously understood that this is an issue, uh, the, the consumption and, and, and uh, opioid addiction problem is an issue across the province and advised that he'd be on the lookout for our application when it uh, is submitted for a, or a consumption treatment service uh, site. Um, but, you know, it was really, that's Minister uh, Jones's uh, wheelhouse or that's Minister Tobolo's wheelhouse. So it's um, a lot of directing to the appropriate ministries, which I understand for a, for a premier. Um, but it, it's it's an issue that uh, I won't, uh, you know, I won't stop talking about until we've got the services available in the community. Gotcha. A couple of minutes left. Let's see if we can touch on two more things here. Uh, first of all, You've got this job, I guess, for another three and a half years. And then, I guess, if you like it and they like you, you'll seek re-election. How would you like the Sioux to be different three and a half years from now compared to what it was when you took over the job? I think the, the mental health and addictions crisis that we're facing, I'd like to see our, our stats on that front improve. I'd like to see fewer opioid overdoses and deaths. I'd like to see more available services to folks who are... Um, uh, in need of them. So I'd like the, it's really the lobbying uh, that, that is my responsibility to, to our provincial cabinet ministers and the municipality's responsibility that I'd like to push more aggressively on over the next three and a half years. That's things that are really external to our 
uh, ability to get done though. So municipally, I'd like to see, um, you know, some more recreational offerings in town. I uh, proposed during the campaign, a, a, a municipal uh, urban waterfront uh, area, like a downtown beach type thing. I'd like to see that implemented, a trolley uh, or a hop on hop off uh, type service uh, to connect our uh, recreational facilities and museums and uh, and cultural offerings like our art gallery. There's there's things within the municipal wheelhouse that uh, I'd like to see get done, and those are the things I've started uh, tackling um, in our community that that we have direct control over, and that hopefully in three and a half years the Sioux will be uh, a, a healthier place, a safer place and a place where there's more things to do than there has been for the last, uh, since, since I grew up here. Okay, last question. I know besides being a lawyer and besides being the mayor, you are a bit of an amateur historian, particularly as it relates to the Sioux. And I know you're a big fan of William Howard Hurst, who was the seventh premier of Ontario and from the Sioux. Uh, Sheldon, bring this picture up if you would. I note that you have two kids. One of them's named Hudson, one of them's named Maxwell. Do I infer from that that you were unable to convince your wife, Jenna, to name one of the kids Hurst? <laughs> so uh, both of them. So Hudson was our uh, was our first. Hudson's our oldest. And uh, we picked kind of like a, a Canadiana type name for him. Uh, Maxwell's my middle name. And so we uh, we passed on the family lineage with his name. But uh, I, I, I don't think we're out, we'll ever have uh, uh, other children. Uh, but I can try and kick at the can uh, if we ever do to see if Hearst will fit into the name uh, nameplate. Uh, it's good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. That's Matthew Shoemaker, Mayor of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Public services cost money, but do governments levy enough taxes to pay for them? We'll debate that tomorrow. Also, we hear from Generation Squeeze's Paul Kershaw on why he says that baby boomers shifted their tax liability to their children. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.